It's on the noise. Can we turn it off? The sound coming out of there. Just turn the volume down on the television. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. Just turn the sound all the way down. Good morning. There's quite a delay, you'll notice, which is why we have to do that. Okay. Uh, you, normally, we don't, we don't know why we have sound out of this today. So we'll just do that and it'll work. Good morning, and it's good to see you. Warm morning, but not too bad in here, right? Still feels fairly comfortable. So thank you for uh, coming in, turning on the fans. Sally, did you do that? Thank you for putting all the fans on this morning. And also for leaving the windows closed because it's hotter out than it is in. So that was a good choice. Uh, our um, lay reader this morning is Val Testani. And without further ado, I let her begin. Good morning. If you're com comfortable to do so, please stand. Call to worship. Rejoice and put your trust in God, creator of heaven and earth, whose, whose faithfulness, faithfulness and, and justice, justice extends, extends through all, through all time. time. God reaches out compassionately, lifting up those who are bowed down and, and oppressed, oppressed, imprisoned, imprisoned and, and hungry. hungry upholding the defenseless and casting down the oppressors. We, we rejoice and praise God, who will reign forever for all generations. The opening hymn is Come Christians Join to Sing.
the unison prayer of confession beginning with a moment of silent confession. Joining together, joy-giving God, we are people who hear the harmony of your grace and love in our souls, but who sing off-key so often. We want to learn new songs, but those haunting tunes of our past mistakes run through our heads. We long to make a joyful noise to you, but the hurts inflicted on us and the pain we have caused others, silence our voices. Sing to us, conductor of grace. Sing of your forgiveness, your hope, your love for us. Strike a chord of humility in our hearts so our eyes could see all you have done for us. And in seeing, we might believe how much you love us. And in believing, we, we would, would echo, echo that new song of hope and life, and life composed through Jesus, Jesus Christ, our, our Lord and Savior. Savior. Our words of assurance. Listen to the melody of the good news. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen, bringing joy into the world. The, the one, one who is dead now lives and wraps us in the delight of life forever with our God. God. Now, now our, our dirges have turned to joy. Our requiem has been rearranged as a hymn of hope. Our, our laments are lost in a cantata of praise. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen. Please be seated. Our prayer for illumination. God of mercy, you promise never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Before I read the gospel, we want to provide you with a little bit of info. In the first part of chapter three, you will find Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath and saying to the Pharisees, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Jesus then goes out and calls the disciple and then goes home. This is where we find him today in John chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. <clears throat> and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his, Jesus' family, heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent, sent to him 
and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my brothers? Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. I invite the children forward. So good to see you guys. How are you? Good? Stand up, Nathaniel. Let me see how tall you are. Pretty darn tall. Okay. <laughs> Let's see how tall you are. Uh-oh. He's going to catch you. <laughs> what do you think? It's good to see you guys. How are you? Getting tall? Yeah? Enjoying life? Ready for summer? Yeah, ready for summer. How's the baby girl? She's good. Yeah, she's beautiful and growing like crazy. What are you going to do when she's as tall as you are? <laughs> we hope that doesn't happen, huh? You think you'll always be taller? What do you think? Maybe? So do you know each other across the way? Can we do names real quick? Say your name. Loud because you got this silly mask on. Brandon. Travis. Liam. Lilia. Okay, it's Lilia. You want to say it to that? Brandon. My name is Brandon. Yeah. Nathaniel. Theodore. Okay, you introduce your sister. And this is Caroline. Caroline. Who's got a hold of Caroline? Uh, <laughs> Who's holding her? Who is that guy? Uh, is he related to you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just like this. It's kind of a... Uh, you can say what yeah. you can say what you call him. I know, but... Uh, What's his name? Do you know? Well, I usually call him dad or daddy, usually. Yeah, dad, daddy. daddy works good. What's his name, do you know? Huh? What's Real his name? Huh? Real yeah. Name? yeah, that other people call him. Uh, Alex? There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. You introduced everybody. Good job. Good job. Well, today, I want to talk about this table right here. And, and, um, This has juice in it, and this has bread. And what do we do at this table? Do you know? What do we do when we get around this table? What do I do when I stand back there? Anything? Do you remember? Do I break the bread? Does everybody get some bread? Do we have the cup? Everybody gets a little bit of juice? What the heck are we having a snack for in the middle of church? Who knows? What? What do you think? Why do you think we're having a snack in the middle of church? Okay. Want me to help you? Okay, maybe they can help us. Yeah. 
Oh, because we can't have coffee hour. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was good, Jason. <laughs> Is that really why? No, <laughs> even they know that's not really why. So let's see, let's see if somebody else knows. <laughs> Anybody else want to explain this at all? You want me to explain it? Sure. I, I see you're not wanting to explain. Okay, so when we come around this table, okay, when Jesus was near the end of his life, he sat down with all of his close buds, his disciples, the people who taught and followed him and, and talked about him. And he sat down with them and he said, basically, my life is, you know, when I'm gone from this life, I want you to still sit around the table and have a meal together. Look at me, guys, so I know you're listening, okay? So I want you to sit around the table and have a meal together. And when you do that meal, I want you to remember me and remember all the things I taught you. So the bread is like my body, which is broken for you so that you can remember how much I love you and how to love each other. Right, in the same way with the cup, the cup kind of, rep we, we say that it represents Jesus' blood poured out for us. It's a symbol, not the real thing, okay? It's a choose. And we say this symbolizes that Jesus died so that we would know how much we're loved. And that's why we come to this table, because we want to remember Jesus. Now, here's my next big question. Who is allowed to come around the table? Can just anybody come and be a part of the dinner at the table, communion? Yes, that's exactly right. Just anybody can come. Jesus didn't stop in the middle and say, only those that I like can come. He didn't say only those that are like me can come. He didn't say only those who have never done anything wrong can come. Jesus invites everybody to the table. So we invite everybody to the table, right? When I was a little kid, here's a, here's a true story. When I was your age, they didn't allow kids to come to the table. And then and the Holy Spirit poured itself out upon the church and reminded us that everybody can come. And we changed our minds and changed the rules, and now everybody comes. Pretty cool, huh? And recently, recently, in this kind of church, in a Presbyterian church, it said only baptized believers can come to the table. And then the Holy Spirit again did a new thing. And a few years ago, the church said, wait a minute, that's not really what Jesus was telling us, we don't think. We think the Holy Spirit's guiding us to do it differently. So now we welcome everyone to the table because we now understand that that's what Jesus would have done, is welcome everyone to the table. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool that we can change our minds too, huh? Learn a new thing. Will you have a prayer with me? And I think... Um, stand up kind of an open circle and I think you guys can all hold hands you guys can all hold hands and I can hold hands with both of you on either side how about that all right let's pray loving God, loving God. we thank you, we thank you. For, welcoming everyone. for welcoming everyone for loving us and reminding us at this table that you love us and care for us so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. It's so good to see you all. I want to uh, thank Val for reading what I thought I had put in the bulletin <laughs> and uh, at the last minute switching what she was doing and doing a good job with it. So thank you. And um, I have to say that this lesson, 
I, I'm imagining that when I wrote these bullet, I wrote the bulletins a few weeks ago, and I'm guessing that I was reading the gospel lesson, and then I read, I read all the scriptures. So I read the gospel, I read 2 Corinthians, and I said, I don't want to tackle that gospel, I'll go with 2 Corinthians. Because the gospel is a little bit more difficult, and I will confess that this sermon ends abruptly, leaving it for you to think about, mostly because it was 10 pages long, and most of my sermons are five. So I thought it was way too long for a communion Sunday, and I needed to find ways to shorten it. So I didn't want to take out the illustration I used, and I left that in, but it also discussion for you to think about, and I sort of thought suddenly, well, maybe it's better if I don't answer the question anyhow, because maybe answering the question for three or four pages is my answer, and we need to answer it differently. So there, there you have a little short didactic about the message this morning. It's a full and complex lesson, and when I read this, I, I quite often will read the scripture to Rich throughout the week, just so I say it out loud, and then I'm thinking about it when I'm doing other things. Um, so when, when I read this to Rich, he said, yeah, there's a half a dozen sermons in there. And, uh, so i I agree. I've attempted to narrow it down a little bit if, and, and probably you've already forgotten all of what Val read, but I'll help you out. Jesus, uh, many things, many things Jesus talks about in this text, but in, uh, with verse 24 and 25, he talks about division. It says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, the house will not be able to stand. If a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, it cannot stand. It's an important lesson for all times, but perhaps especially for now and in our time, in our moment. As a humanity, we have to work together. Together we can indeed embrace the Holy Spirit and bring change to a world that all too often stops with the things God did in history. Did you catch that point in the children's story of the Holy Spirit changing us as a church? throughout time, all too often, Christianism stops with the things God did in history, but God is alive and active and present in this moment. We take the stories of scripture literally, even knowing that Jesus taught in parables and end up believing that God doesn't breathe anew in us today. We get stuck sometimes and attempt to hold everything to historic standard without regard for the history we're writing in this moment, without regard for the timeless nature of scripture. Often Christianity likes to take things so literally that there's no room for the Holy Spirit to speak through scripture in today's context. In our time, we can see ourselves to be a humanity whose house is divided. Even Christianity as a whole is indeed a house divided. I read this week this piece that I really would like to share with you, and it um, me, <clears throat> it is it was a uh, I did share it, so some of you may have taken the time to read it, but it was rather long, so probably most of you did not. When you share things that are more than a couple bites on online, it doesn't get read. Um, and this. This piece is um, by a woman named Jen Abel. Uh, well, that's the name she goes by in her blog. I don't know if that's, people have different names for, but she shared something that my, some of my more, uh, my relatives and friends who were at one time more evangelical and conservative affirm. She says, and this is, couple pages, so give me, give ear. It's important. She says, I see my conservative evangelical friends lamenting the shrinking of their churches 
and whispering prayer requests for those who aren't walking with the Lord anymore. I want us to hear ourselves in this, okay? Let me just pause. So even though we're talking about the evangelical right, which is where she comes from, we also can hear ourselves in it. It's <clears throat> both and. I see my conservative evangelical friends lamenting the shrinking of their churches and whispering prayer requests for those who aren't walking with the Lord anymore. Hashtag evangelical is trending on Twitter. There is an entire corner of TikTok with videos about deconstructing faith or coming out of fundamentalism. Clearly, this is a hot topic in Christianity right now. Generally, over the past decades, I have constructed and reconstructed my own faith, leaving behind some of the trappings of evangelicalism while holding tightly to Jesus himself. And I'm not an expert at all. I only know my own experiences, but I've been out of that subculture of conservative evangelical church for a while now. I made some ob observations from a perspective I didn't have when I was enmeshed in it. The evangelical churches I know are trapped in legalism and entangled with Christian nationalism. Through preaching the a gospel of Christ alone, they add lists of rules required for sanctification because salvation might be through, through faith alone, but evidently sanctification demands great personal effort and discipline. And, and in spite of these many teachings about world mission, the evangelical God, with a little g, seems to love the United States of America just a bit more than any other country. So world mission tends to look a lot like colonization. And through, and, excuse me, and though every evangelical church I've been a part of encourages congregants to not take our word for it, read the Bible for yourself, then people truly read, when people truly read the Bible and come to a different conclusion, they quickly become labeled troublemakers or backsliders or heretics. All that to say there's little room for difference of opinion or difference of understanding. One evangelical church I belong to refused to participate in any activities with believers of other denominations because you may be ushering in one world religion. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it, but some other believers call it a preview of heaven. <laughs> but for real, some of these churches teach that they are the only church preaching the truth, that other churches are leading people straight to hell, and that to be a real Christian, you have to go to this church. <clears throat> so those evangelical churches create this tiny box and say, if you aren't in this tiny box, then you aren't really a Christian. The tiny box requires attendance multiple times a week in this particular church. The tiny box stipulates that versions of the what versions of the Bible you can read. The tiny box forbids alcohol and somehow, in spite of demanding a very little translation of the Bible, twists the verses with reference to alcohol to, to mean juicy juice or not, and not barefoot sellers. The tiny box fixates on sex and all the rules about sex. The tiny box creates an even tinier nesting box for women with additional rules about what to wear, when to speak, and what personal autonomy the tiny box at best tolerates and at worst perpetuates racism. The tiny box conflates a love of Jesus with a love of U.S. and misapplies Bible verses about ancient Israel to modern day USA, promoting Christian nationalism. When people begin reading the Bible and coming to some different conclusion, conclusions that don't fit within the tiny box, they begin questioning their faith completely. Because if you're told your entire life that if you aren't in this tiny box, then you aren't really Christian. 
and you don't fit in that tiny, when you don't fit in that tiny box anymore, it only stands to reason that you begin to wonder if you're really a Christian. Make sense? So here we are. Essentially, the church has pushed people out of the church by turning non-essentials into essentials, by adding rules and stipulations and preferences onto the gospel of Jesus. And then the church stands around wringing its hands about all the people who have turned their backs on the church or stopped walking with God. Parents are weeping over the prodigal children. But so many of these prodigals seem drawn to the life of action. The message of Jesus himself, they don't fit in the church's tiny box anymore. She goes on, I saw something the other day that said, we grew up in a church that prayed for a generation to rise up and bring revival. Well, here we are. Here's a generation of people attempting to take the message of Jesus, relentless mercy and open, wide open grace, love for God, love for the world, truly good news for everyone, a welcome shelter for oppressed and the refugee and the poor, an upheaval of society's power structure and wrestle that message from its entanglement with idols of nationalism and extreme capitalism and legalism and ploys for political power. Perhaps this is the revival we have been praying for. Perhaps this evangelical moment is the revival we need. Perhaps the people who've left the tiny box are the ones who are truly walking with the Lord. And it's time for conservative evangelicals to release the legalism and nationalism and climb out of the box and join us, she says. This is a blog post, um, Jen Abel, J-E-N-N-A-B-E-L dot blog. 2021, 531. Now let it sink in. Let it sink in for just a second, and I promise I will let it go. Let it be out there. We too have a tiny box. I live in it. I worry that someone's gonna be upset by what I post. And let me tell you, it's fair game on clergy to attack them wherever and whenever you choose. I live it. I worry because I don't want to deal with that, someone upset by what I post, what I say, or what I do. We, even me, seem actually okay with adding things to what we do as a church, but not taking them away. I'm now getting older, and I don't have the energy to fight about it. It's just time to do the next thing the church always does this time of year. That's how the calendar goes. In the meantime, as we do what we always do, because it's what we've always done, we've added a few things, and I'm getting tired. In the meantime, the Supreme Court is looking at legislation that threatens to roll back a women's right to make a decision and a choice rights that other clergy many years ago fought hard for alongside of women. I'm afraid to preach or protest when my heart says, thou shalt not kill. You know, those are the most controversial things I ever post. In the meantime, I know and learn about the wealthy money, wealth and money that was poured into the propaganda and poured into politics to convince us that anyone who speaks out against guns is against the Second Amendment and is a snowflake. In the meantime, people are dying. We as a nation are pummeled with false tales of voter fraud because the nation finally got organized enough to help everyone find a way to exercise their right to vote. We finally found a way 
to let the marginalized even have a voice in a society that claims they have a voice. Not just those fortunate enough to have time off and the means to get to the polls. In the meantime, in the meantime, state after state, led by dark, a dark money organization called the Heritage Society, rolls back voting to carefully exclude the poor. And it really rolls back voting for those who looked, who looked like Jesus looked. And we're tired and we're complacent. We are a tiny box, all of our own making, and it's hard and it's frightening to get out of. Study the scriptures, study what Jesus says, study what Jesus does. How inclusive, how amazing, full of grace and full of love, including absolutely everyone. And thou shalt not kill. I, I try to move past that because I know that there are just wars and there are holy wars. Thou shalt not kill is in my soul. It's not just a word I read in the Bible. It's in my soul. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? In the meantime, the Holy Spirit's trying to bring us out of our tiny box. The Holy Spirit is speaking. Oh, I, I know, I'm true, true story. I am impatient as all get out. When the Holy Spirit speaks, I want it done now. And my God, it takes 50, 60, 70, 100 years when the Holy Spirit speaks for us to move to a new thing. And I know I do not have patience. I'm, I can just always, my mother used to say that, you know, we should have patience. I say, well, it's not a gift God gave me. Maybe that's why, why I'm here, because I don't have patience. And I get tired. I get tired. Maybe, just maybe, there are a lot of faith-filled people out there who have broken out of the box, have broken free because they understand they're, they're, we're not going where we pray to go. We're praying to be led to a new time and a new thing. And then we stop because we really are frightened by what is new and different. Just maybe the spirit is leading us to a new thing and a new time. And if we don't listen, I have to say this, we have to listen. If we don't listen, we'll be our own demise. So I'm going to close now, right? Before I tell you what I thought the answers are, <laughs> before the next three or four pages, I'm going to tell you, I think that we all need to think about how we are stuck in our own tiny box. That's the first thing is to recognize it. Recognize how we are stuck in our own tiny box. And I'm not talking just the church. I'm talking beyond in our well, in our personal lives, in our, in our communities, how are we stuck in the box? I cringe every time someone says, well, we used to. Right? How are we stuck? And then the next question is, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to move forward? Getting out of the box. Maybe it's just a finger at a time that gets out of the box. When I was in, just out of seminary, 1993, I went to the Reimagining Conference in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. Reimagining Conference had a picture of a box, three sides and then a little curve in. And then it had three lines coming out for a creator, redeemer, sustainer, trying to get out of the box. 
came back from that conference and was told on the floor of Presbytery that I was a heretic. The discussion was tabled and I did not get to respond. So let me just say, I got shut back into the box. I was not yet 30. We keep trying to close the lid. How are we gonna leave the lid open? Things for us to not only think about, but to ask people who are not in the church about. We all know many spiritual people who push against organized religion, but maybe the question is, what do we need to do or how do we need to reform ourselves so that we are serving the needs of a community that's moving forward with the Holy Spirit in the head leading us? I'll, I'll be quiet now. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for your word to us this morning, and we pray that we might hear your voice calling us out of the box. We might hear your spirit leading us. Help us to not silence those who would do things differently. Help us to be inspired. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't have a prayer of, on, on communion Sundays, we don't have a pastoral prayer in the bulletin. Are there prayers that you would like to have? Thank you for making the list, even though I didn't have it in the bulletin. Um, are there prayers, Becky sometimes does things intuitively, which is great. <clears throat> are there prayers to add? Yes, Tina. Caprice's grandmother, okay. Val. Prayer, pr prayers for a couple who are struggling with cancer. Okay. Yes. Prayers for a cousin who's in Burlington with heart problems. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you didn't know, Carla's home. Yeah. Prayers for Carla. A little calmness while she heals. I don't know if you're listening, Carla, <laughs> but we got gotcha. you. <laughs> Prayers for Jay as he helps. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. So please lift up and hold all these things in, in your prayers in the coming weeks and in the coming week, and we'll Keep them on the list before us. We can give to the church and the work of the church through our offering, and we can do that in many ways, and we need people to do that in many ways. Um, so you can give online. I invite you to go to uh, fpcogdensburg.com and follow the links to give online. You can mail a contribution to the church at 311 Franklin Street, Ogdensburg 13669. We are, the free lunch is in good shape right now. We are gratefully getting um, lots of meat from the um, local grocery store that is uh, frozen and uh, very good for us and perfect. Our freezers are full, our account is full. So, so know that we're in good shape and I'll let you know if we need more help again, uh, if and when. We could use people to sign up to help with the free lunch. So um, that would be very helpful to have people sign up to, to work on that. Anything else? So if we could um, join together, if you would like to um, join in the uh, prayer of dedication, I, I, and if you're comfortable standing, please feel free to do so. Get you a little stretch out. I talked too much today. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come, come upon, upon us this day. day. We, we feel, feel your joy and delight as we celebrate this glorious day. With a, a sense, sense of happiness and gratitude, 
We eagerly offer you these financial gifts for your ministry in this community and beyond. May all be saved from selfishness and filled with grace-filled habits of generous giving. All praise and glory be unto you. Amen. You may be seated. I invite us to the Lord's table. It is with joy and gratitude that we come to this table. And this table is not my table, not the church's table. This is the Lord's table. And all are welcome at the Lord's table. If you remember that we had the, the Holy Spirit, we're only a few weeks out of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit touches every single person and we are all Welcome together. Come to this table and join with prayer. We dream, O oh God, of community, but in waking hours we forget such hopes and our, our dreams we call alien, our sisters and brothers, we, we call strangers. Well, you call us by name with arms outstretched as on a cross. You call us to yourself and you name your people your own. So with arms outstretched, we now embrace new friends and forgotten dreams in the body broken and life blood poured out, transform our fears, and revive our visions. Renew us, O oh God, with your spirit that we may receive this mystery given for us embracing its manifold gifts and needs, shouting an amen that resounds through our world. On the night of his arrest, Jesus sat down to celebrate the Passover meal with the disciples. And after first giving thanks, he took bread and he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you as often as you do this. Remember me. Together, we join in the bread of life. After supper, he took the cup in the same way and said, this cup stands for the new covenant that is sealed in my blood. As often as you drink of this, you remember me. Together we share in the cup of salvation. Each time we come to this table, we proclaim Christ's life, death, and resurrection until he comes again, recognizing the risen Christ among us in the Holy Spirit. Let us come together for the prayer of dedication. Holy Spirit, come, oh, I'm at the wrong place, sorry. All praise is yours, O oh God. You bring us to this table as sisters and brothers. Lead us on through your hearts to that glorious day when all your children will gather as family. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our peace made flesh. Amen.
Are there any announcements this morning? I do want to, this is a very odd prayer, but um, in a time of COVID, there are odd prayers. I'm a, a golf fan. Anybody been watching the golf this weekend? Yes. Did you see what happened to John Rahm? Yeah. So he's leading the tournament and been leading it soundly for three days. And he's got like a five shot lead. Yep. And um, he was exposed to COVID and he has COVID for the second time and he can't play the last round and he will have to forfeit the tournament. And it's heartbreaking for this young man who's worked so hard. And so just, oh boy, it's two things. It teaches us that he got exposed. He knew he was, he knew he was exposed, so he had to be tested. He's been tested now three times that it came back positive. He was tested, tested, negative, 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 then a positive, 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 all in the same 24 hours. So it's not like a fluke bad test. And so it's just a, he just fell to his knees and said, not again. And it's, it's sad. Uh, so we're living in a hard time and it's a hard time for a lot of people. Um, and he definitely is in the spotlight. I wish, I wish the media would leave him alone because it's just devastating for him. And, um, but a little prayer for this young man and his family, because it's a hard, he also, because he's now isolated for two weeks, misses the, the next major tournament. So tough stuff uh, for him. So just a silly thought. Are there other prayers, other thoughts, other announcements? Um, I, uh I, I need to just ask Val, do we need more orders? Uh, we've got 29. Okay. First 30. Oh, we do have 30. Okay. Yeah, when I left on Thursday, we only had 25, I think. Okay. So, okay, good. That takes away one announcement I wanted to make. The other thing, 31. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, during this really difficult time, um, the fact that we have technology that allows us um, to be online and worship um, when we feel we cannot leave home. And um, I just wanted people at home to remember that that comes at a cost, a really big cost to the church. And if you can find a way to once in a while go on our Facebook or our, our, our um, website and um, give a little money through PayPal, it would be really helpful, really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Anything else, Rhonda? Classic cars, a food truck, a band, Friday night at the museum. That can't be bad. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, outside. Yeah. I've never thought God does weather, but I'll pray for good weather. <laughs> looks like it's going to be good, actually. The long range looks great. And it doesn't look too hot. It looks like a 70-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So lots to think about. I'm leaving it in your hands to think about getting out of the box. So if you would like to, if you're able to do so comfortably, stand for the charge and benediction. Oh, go into the world and spread love and peace. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always. Amen. Amen. Amen.